Welcome to my podcast, Asking the Question, If Not Now, When? This is Cindy Brown, and thank you for joining me today. For more information, visit me at ifnotnowwhen.best. I am so excited about today's episode with my special guest, Dr. Emanuela Wallach, MD. I had met her uh, quite a few years ago. She was the keynote speaker at an event I attended. Not only is she a board-certified OBGYN, but she's also focused on integrative medicine, including disease prevention, women's health, bioidentical hormones, holistic living. And I was so impressed with her approach to medicine and women's health that I became a patient of hers. And it's no wonder she won the prestigious Helen Lansman Award for the physician with the greatest compassion towards patients. It's a completely different experience when you sit down with Dr. Wallach. She doesn't meet you first in an examination room. You sit down with her in her office, and she gets to know you. And she treats you holistically. What I mean by holistically is looking at our overall health through the lens of diet, lifestyle, including quality of sleep, physical activity, stress levels, and understanding how it all impacts our health and longevity. And I can't tell you how honored I am to have her on our show today. It's not often that we have the opportunity to ask candid questions and learn from a doctor with her credentials. During our conversation, we talk about menopause, both female and male menopause. We talk about some of the health and life extending benefits of hormone replacement therapy with so many stigmas regarding this topic based on outdated science. And we talk about the difference between bioidentical hormones and synthetic hormones. We talk about great sex in the second half of our lives and some cutting edge therapies and treatments that Dr. Wallach offers helping us look and feel great, extending our life and health spans. So without further delay, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Wallach. So Dr. Wallach, thank you so much for joining us today. I can't tell you how excited I am to have you here. You know, As you know, the heart and soul of my podcast is to help our listeners have an amazing second half of their life. And I can't think of a better person to help share some of your wisdom and knowledge that for me has been so personally helpful. So with that, Dr. Wallach, tell us a little bit about your story. What, what made you interested in medicine, gynecology, obstetrics, and then more interesting is your interest in integrative medicine and longevity, which is such a blessing to find somebody that has combined all of those talents and practices. Hello. And thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here and share my knowledge with your um, audience. Uh, I was born and raised in Paris, and I went to medical school in Paris, where at that time, a few years ago, it was all about learning about the whole body. We did have classes in nutrition. We did have classes in exercise we did understand that the body was a whole. And medical students in Paris, in many cities in Europe, are trained to be first internists for seven years. And then they become specialists if they want to, and they take an additional training for two or three years, and they become specialists. And the, the reason why I wanted to go to medical school is uh, growing up, I always felt a calling to be what we would call nowadays a healer at that those, that word does not exist back then. I was mm -hmm. always fascinated by Chinese people who would do acupuncture. And I grew up in a family where um, my grandmother, who was from Eastern Europe, would do copying on me at home. And I understand oh. that that's being done now by acupuncturists. It's very popular. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was natural. If I had a cold or not feeling well, I, she would put the cups on my back, which would bring the blood flow to the area, and I would feel better. And I grew up with acupuncture. As soon as I got my first period at age 13, and I had menstrual cramps, my mother took me to an acupuncturist, and she was able to help me. So 
it all came together when I decided to go to medical school. So I then moved to Miami when I was 28 years old, and I did my residency, my specialty in obstetrics and gynecology in Miami, uh, a University of Miami. And I decided to choose this field because it's a happy field. I knew I didn't have to deal with chronic illnesses. I knew I could help young women have their children and then follow them through life. And I stopped doing obstetrics, which is the art of delivering babies, about 20 years ago. And now I do specialty gynecology um, longevity or age management. And I love it because I take care of the women I met many, many years ago, and I help them to go through the transition. They're aging with me together. Mm -hmm. And I even love it more, the fact that now they bring me their daughters that I delivered more than 50 years ago. (laughs) Goodness, how fantastic. Yes. I'm really, I'm having goosebumps when I think about it. Oh, So I I think more about myself as a more specialized and proactive internist because I take care of the whole person. Right, right. And I am telling you, it is hard to find somebody or doctors that do holistic or take care of the whole body because it's all interconnected. And I have found it to be challenging at times going to specific doctors and they prescribe a pharmaceutical pill and say, see you later. But to have somebody that takes the time to really understand your physical health, your mental health, what your lifestyle is like, and work with you and partner with you is is so helpful. Before we go any further, let's just talk a little bit about OBGYN, obstetrics and gynecology. What is the difference And then there are some other fields also that I'd like you to talk about urogynecology as I do have a friend who was treated by the wrong doctor or could have been treated by a better specialist. And it can be sometimes confusing to understand what each specialty is, if you can help us understand that. So during the four years of general obstetrics and gynecology residency, Mm -hmm. a doctor is being trained as being a general obstetrician gynecologist. Obstetrics means following a patient, a pregnant patient during the nine month of pregnancy, Mm -hmm. doing the delivery, either vaginal delivery or cesarean section, and then doing the postpartum care for the next six weeks. That's what obstetrics means. The OB part of the OBGYN. Exactly. Okay. Gynecology is taking care of the non-pregnant women starting at puberty, starting with the need to be on birth control pill to prevent pregnancy, uh, taking care of sexually transmitted infections, taking care of polycystic ovaries, hormonal imbalance, menopause, surgery. So that's what a general gynecologist would do. Great, the GYN part. And then tell us about urogynecologist and help us understand that. Urogynecologist are gynecologists who finished the four years of residency as general OBGYN. Mm-hmm. And then they decide to do a fellowship, an additional three years in urology, learning all about connection between the bladder, the urethra, the vagina. It's all interconnected. And mm-hmm. taking care of overactive bladder, urinary incontinence, prolapses, meaning when the either the bladder, the rectum, or the uterus falls down, and they do surgery. But they also use techniques that are called biofeedbacks, where they learn the patient to do pelvic floor rehabilitation. So it's a combination of medical and surgical, but that's all they do. They do not do pap smear. They do not do menopause or contraception. Super. That is so helpful because it can be confusing sometimes out there. So let's talk a little bit about menopause. I've got a couple questions that I've experienced, and I'm sure some of my listeners are or will or have experienced some of these things as well. But first, there's perimenopause and menopause. So the difference between the two are what? So perimenopause are the five to 10 years before menopause. Officially, menopause is absence of periods for 12 months, but that's a very old definition. Okay. 
patients may experience menopausal symptoms even before they start missing periods, and that would be called perimenopause. And it's due to a drop in levels of progesterone, which is one of the two female hormones. There are two female hormones and two male hormones. The two female hormones are estradiol or estrogens and progesterone. And the first one whose levels go down is progesterone. And that's what triggers the night sweats, the irregular periods, or the opposite, two periods in a month, or heavy bleedings, mood swings, PMS type syndromes. Menopause, it's better usually, or it could be worse. In addition to that, it affects hot flashes, short term memory issues, insomnia. Actually, most of my patients come with the symptoms of fatigue, low energy, and insomnia, as opposed to hot flashes and night sweats. Do you think the insomnia is part of the reason is the hot flashes, meaning they're hot and they wake up? Yes. Or is it? Yeah, yeah. because I think that was my experience. I was just always hot at night and I kept waking up. And I, I know that if you know, I did an episode on, on good sleep and I know that 62 to 65 degrees is ideal to get that deep sleep. And man, I would just, I would always be really hot. And then that would affect the quality of my sleep. Definitely. But sleep is such a complex issue because you can add also stress, whatever happened during the day. Yes. Yeah. It has an impact. And maybe in your talk, you spoke about the sympathetic system versus the parasympathetic system. And we need to... I didn't go into that. Mm -hmm. But that's very interesting. I talk a lot about it in my practice. Um, I am very interested what's going on in the brain. I also wanted to be a psychiatrist, but I couldn't do two residencies. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Because I think everything goes back to the brain at the end of the day. Absolutely. And it's the connection between the mind, the body, and especially the gut, the gastrointestinal system. And parasympathetic system is the calming system. Unfortunately, we live in a world where it's very difficult to slow down and take deep breath. We are multitasking like never before. Mm-hmm. And this, we're very, especially with news on TV, on the internet, or we are always solicited. People expect an answer from us right away. Mm-hmm. And that activates the, the bad system, the sympathetic system, which releases the adrenals. And that conveys into bad sleep uh, because it it continues throughout the day and the night. And people wake up also because they cannot quiet their mind. Yes. It's still active. And there are some things, I'm sure you spoke about some supplements to take and things like not going on your iPad or computer an hour before sleep. sleep, Right. That blue light that, right. right, Sleep hygiene. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I wanted to ask you about all of these, the hot flashes, the night sweats, vaginal dryness, thinning of the vaginal wall, brain fog, mood swings, weight gain, all of these things. If I'm hearing you right, the cause of all of this and the changes in our body is because of the reduction of progesterone and estrogen. Is that right. what's, that's, that's what's okay. causing these? Yes. First, progesterone. And then when a woman hits menopause, her blood levels of estrogen reaches zero. Exactly. Okay. Now for listeners that have not gone through menopause yet, kind of the ready, set, go. Is there anything from a lifestyle, diet, lifestyle perspective that isn't a hundred percent genetic where we'd say I could influence prior to even perimenopause or in perimenopause my symptoms to reduce those symptoms? That's an interesting question because perimenopause and menopause is actually genetically determined. It's always Mm -hmm. important to ask your mother how old she was when she went through menopause because usually the patient will go through menopause at the same age. And menopause is when there are no more eggs in the ovaries, basically. A woman runs out of eggs, does not ovulate Mm -hmm. anymore, and does not release those two female hormones. But some symptoms, even menopausal symptoms, could appear a few years before. It has to do with stress. Stress reduction 
symptoms are definitely worse if cortisol is elevated because Interesting. hot flashes may also be due to cortisol stress and it's called adrenal stress. The adrenals are the little glands on top of the kidneys that release epinephrine, norepinephrine. So um, sometimes the level, the blood levels of hormones are normal and a patient is still experiencing hot flashes and night sweats. So mm -hmm. we do a saliva test to measure the amount of cortisol during the day. And if it's very high, there are some supplements to take. It's called adaptogen. And we're talking about Ayurvedic medicine with uh, supplements like ashwagandha or rhodiola that would lower the cortisol and that's going to lower the hot flashes as well. See, I had no idea that you could do that. I did know that at least that from a sleep cycle perspective, if you're able to get, this is what I have heard, exercise in the morning, sun in the morning increases cortisol levels, which then when cortisol levels are increased, melatonin is decreased. So then at night, if you've increased your cortisol levels in the morning, then at night, your melatonin levels are high and cortisol is low. And this is true. And that, yeah, that was something fascinating, but I had no idea that there were herbs that could help us as well. What role does food play in menopause? And I'd heard that uh, higher dairy and meat versus lower dairy and meat has some effect on menopause, or does fiber um, impact estrogen levels? These are a couple things regarding diet that I had heard. Yes, and I'm really passionate about nutrition. Uh, mm -hmm. Being raised in France, it was a shock for me when I moved here in Miami at age 28. Uh, the food was so bad. Uh, back then, it's a little bit better now, and now we have choices. Mm -hmm. We could choose organic food. So for women, it's always advisable to buy non-GMO food. Otherwise, there is an excess of the bad estrogen. It's called xenoestrogen that could increase the risk for breast cancer and thyroid cancer as well. They're two, the two of them are related. And also be careful not to eat too many dairy products, especially the way it's made now. There's so much hormones in the milk and in red meat. Ah, so it's the, the, it's the added hormones. When we talk about dairy and meat, yes. it's the industrial raised meat that has the impact on estrogen levels because of the added hormones yes. to the and, food. And that's why eating fiber every day is a must because the bad estrogen will bind to the fiber and will be eliminated in the stools. So you're absolutely right. Incorporating Interesting. fiber, either a lot of vegetables, of course, organic vegetables, mm -hmm. or a scoop of fiber in a smoothie or a capsule of fiber every day. Very good recommendations. Wonderful. Yeah. Such good information. So my podcast is all about making the second half of life amazing and definitely great sex is a good part of that. So let's talk about sex after menopause. Okay. So some experience not being in the mood, it takes longer to reach orgasm, it's painful rather than pleasurable. What are your recommendations to make sure that we have great sex after menopause? So as I said previously, everything starts because of lower level of hormones everywhere, including in the genital area, around mm -hmm. the clitoris and in the vaginal walls, the vulva, everything becoming dry, except if I put the patient on hormones. And we can talk about the advantages of going on bioidentical hormones. And the decrease in DHEA and testosterone, which are the two male, male hormones, would be responsible for decreased sex drive, decreased libido, and difficulty to reach an orgasm. So it's all linked. Interesting. My, yes. My recommendations, besides going on bioidentical hormones, transdermally or vaginally, mm -hmm. would be also to talk about nitric oxide supplements. It's called NO. And to talk about vaginal laser surgery, which is done in the office. Okay. So let's talk about bioidentical hormones. Yes. And the difference between bioidentical versus synthetic. I appreciate that. I think that's a point of trying to understand what the difference is. 
Yes, and so, women are very confused mm -hmm. um, because of the famous study that came back in 2002 telling women that going on hormone replacement therapy did increase the risk for breast cancer. But that study was made with synthetic hormones, prim primary and prem pro, which are not used anymore. Nowadays, we use only bioidentical hormones. And the word means that the chemical formula resembles exactly the chemical formula of the hormones we used to make before menopause. There are no added, no additive, no changes in the chemical formula. And there are two ways of giving those hormones. They could be FDA approved, and you can find them at any drugstore, in the form of a patch or capsules, or non-FDA approved, and these can be compounded to the patient's needs in a compounding pharmacy. And when you talk about to the patient's needs, so I know, how do you know what those levels are? I mean, what would be the optimal level? Is it the hormone level that 30 or 20, or is how do you determine the dosage, I guess um, is the best way to ask. Right. So I'm being very careful because I want to help my patients, mm -hmm. but I don't want to increase the risk for any cancer. So I will, personally, I will never bring the levels back to when she was age 25. I don't think it makes any sense because that would okay. be increasing the level, the risk for cancer. In my personal practice, I do increase the level, but not so high, just enough to be comfortable and to be able to stay on hormone replacement therapy for the rest of their life, because there's no reason to stop if they're feeling fine. Got it. Now, I'd also heard, though, that estrogen reduces the risk of heart disease as being another benefit of hormone replacement therapy. Is this correct? This is correct. If it's given transdermally, it does protect the heart, it does protect the bones, the brain, the memory, because our body has receptors for estrogen and progesterone everywhere. So okay. it's correct. Again, uh, it has an effect on the endothelium, which is a lining of the arteries. Got and it. And to go back to um, the previous question, how to increase the sex drive and libido, we need to talk about the male hormones a little bit. Yes. So in age management practice, we doctors, we do prescribe DHEA and testosterone, but again, very safe levels. And I, in my practice, I like to talk about the possibility of doing testosterone pellets, which is inserting a little pellet, which is the size of a grain of rice underneath the skin in the upper part of the buttock. And it's bioidentical testosterone and it's being released every day for three to four months. So a patient would come to my office to do a five minute procedure every three to four months. The other option is to apply cream daily, a transdermal cream. But the, the pellet, then you don't have to think about it. That's the advantage and they love it. It's good, especially for women who do exercise a lot, who are at the gym or exercise at home every day. They, they do much better. Why would the pellet, if you're exercising, do much better? Just because the, uh, the release is consistent? Exactly. That's the word. It's a consistent release. There's no up and down. And uh -huh. a transdermal approach. Exactly. Now, if that's the testosterone, but what if you're in a, you have a, the mixture of estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone? One would be a pellet, but then the other you still would put on transdermally, correct? Correct. Uh, estra estrogen, we do a mix of estradiol and estriol, and we call it biased cream. The mm -hmm. estriol is called the weak estrogen, and it's the one that protects the breast, and you do apply the cream twice a day. The progesterone is a must, has to be given to counterbalance the effect of estrogen. And I give it even in women who have a uterus, as opposed to traditional gynecologists to tell their patients you do not need it after a hysterectomy. And the reasons are we have progesterone receptors in the brain, in the bones. I'm thinking about keeping strong bones. Very important to prevent osteoporosis as we are living longer and longer. So it would be one pellet, 
sometimes we're able to put a second pellet together, uh, estradiol. Some women are willing to try. It doesn't always work. Sometimes it triggers bleeding. So we try, and if it doesn't work, I just continue with a testosterone pellet alone. Got it. And I was going to ask you about bone density, but you certainly did answer that. But it does, bone density, as I understand, you can't go backwards, meaning growing bone again, but you can slow down or stop. Is that correct? That is correct. So naturally, everybody loses 2% of bones every year. Mm -hmm. And we do recommend to do a bone density at the onset of menopause to get a baseline and then to repeat it every two to three years. And certainly hormone replacement therapy does help to slow down together with exercise, vitamin D3, vitamin K2, and magnesium. It all works together. Interesting. You'd mentioned uh, men. Do do men go through menopause as well? Do they benefit at all from hormone replacement therapy? They do. It's called andropause. And the best way to check is to do a blood test to check their testosterone level. It should be more than 350. And if it's Mm -hmm. less, they, they benefit from getting either pellets, injections, or transdermal cream. Got it. Now, my favorite topic of longevity. So as I said, I'd done an episode in longevity, and my goal is to live to 120. So within this wonderful field that I think there's so many more people becoming very interested of some of the really promising health extending science that's out there, tell us some some things that you have seen that have really brought light to opportunities to extend our health span. So, yes, I would like to talk about telomeres, first of all. Okay. Telomeres are the equivalent of the end cap of a shoelace, and it's inside each DNA, inside each cell, and it appears to be the single best marker of longevity. And you can ask your doctor to check your telomeres to see where you're at. Some studies say that taking vitamin D which, by the way, is considered a hormone more than a supplement nowadays. Interesting. So having vitamin D level around 80, 80, 80 nanogram per ml will prevent shrinkage of telomere. So something to keep watching, telomeres. And I know there are many companies who are trying to market products to maintain telomeres length. I do not believe there's a single one I could recommend yet, but I just wanted to to mention it to our audience. And then I will move on to other products that I've tried in my practice, in particular peptides. Peptides are groups of amino acids, which are precursors of human growth hormones. So I know some anti-aging doctors do prescribe human growth hormone, but I decided not to um, because there are some side effects such as increasing the risk for cancer in general or diabetes. Okay. So I decided to look into something a little bit different, the precursors. And there's a whole list, a whole catalog of peptides we can use depending on the action that we want to achieve. The most popular one is the CJC-1295 together with the ipamorelin, and that would be a subcutaneous injection done by the patient herself or himself at home before bedtime, five days a week for three months at a time, and then take a break of a month and then repeat. And that promotes better sleep helps to lose the weight. So basically it works a little bit like human growth hormone, but doesn't have the side effect. It's a precursor. It's just, it's very safe. It's just a group of amino acids, precursor of human growth hormone. Another emerging component is NAD, which stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. It's a cofactor essential to metabolism. And it's found in all living cells. It's, um, it does support the cellular energy, and it does help to maintain healthy DNA. 
Is it's, it related to the mitochondria? I, like a little bit, but not really. Okay. Uh, what is related to mitochondria is the ATP. It's a bit different. Okay. Yes. Okay. So it's the body premier cellular energy and longevity molecules. It's also an emerging field, and there are so many companies right now promoting either capsules or a liposomal formula, liposomal form of NAD+. plus. That's how it's sold. It's sold under the name NAD+. plus. I'm not going to mention brands because I, I'm not endorsing any brands. Right. But it, it, is, it requires a prescription, correct? Uh, no, actually, um, the one I use, yeah, does require a prescription through my compounding pharmacist, but I did the search and you can find it online. Some companies are selling it, either capsules or liposomal formula. Okay. I don't know it, how it works, but that's something to watch as well. The NAD and the peptides, those two are very promising. That sounds exciting. Mm-hmm. I've heard of NAD a couple times, so I think it's, and with some very positive results. I know there's an elderly, elder, elderly gentleman who is in his 80s and is supplementing with NAD and is just mentally sharp, physically sharp, true signs of the, the slowing of the aging process. It's certainly, you're right, something to watch. And I don't think it has any side effect. Really, I looked into it. There's no side effect. So it's worth trying for a couple of years because mm-hmm. longevity is all about aging gracefully, keeping our memory sharp, our eyesight, and our mobility. I'm always looking at those three factors. From there. What are some of the, I know that you do some cosmetic procedures as well in your office. Platelet rich plasma, something I've heard. And I know you've done some other types of cosmetic procedures. We do mainly the PRP because it's very safe. We do not do stem cell injection. Uh That would be another topic. Uh, PRP is when we spin the blood, we take, we draw one tube of blood and we spin it in a centrifuge. And then we inject the top that is rich in platelet in different parts of the body. So it could be, of course, you think anti-aging the face. So we could right. inject in the face or for thinning hair. It does help to bring more blood flow to the scalp and it does prevent thinning hair. Um, I do not do it personally. I have a nurse practitioner who does it. And it's very successful with men. I've seen great, great results in men who are losing hair or who have thinning hair. We do it on husbands of our patients. What I do is the um, O-shot to increase the orgasm, the vaginal orgasm and the clitoral orgasm. Same technique. Yes. After I apply a layer of a topical anesthetic for half an hour, And then Mm -hmm. using a very small and very thin needle, I inject the platelet-rich plasma where the G-spot is supposed to be and on the hood of the clitoris. I know it sounds painful, but it's not. It does sound (laughs) painful. No, 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 no. And so I do that part. That's that's considered PRP. It lasts Uh about 18 months. Interesting. I had no idea that even existed. And that together, combined with the CO2 vaginal laser that prevents vaginal dryness, is yes. great to prevent painful intercourse and to keep sex going after menopause. That's a good thing. So Dr. Wallach, there was another therapy. It's called IV nutrition therapy. What is that? Can you tell us about that? The, yes, this is one of the modalities we offer in our office which is basically IV nutrition therapy. We start an IV and give you a bag of very high doses of supplements, vitamin C, B-complex, glutathione, which is a major antioxidant. And we do recommend this to be done for patients who suffer from chronic fatigue syndrome due to a reactivation of the Epstein-Barr virus or for patients who are getting chemotherapy for cancer, it has been shown to improve the results to chemotherapy if they come in between the sessions and if they do receive very high doses of vitamin C only. 
And we're talking about enormous amounts of vitamin C. We take our time. The patient is sitting in a reclining chair and it takes about an hour and a half. The drip goes very slowly and I've had very good success with those patients. And does it also have any um, longevity effects that help us feel and look better? Yes, there is actually a cocktail that I put together to help with the skin, to improve the skin, the collagen in the skin. Yes, it's called, nice. the, it's called the ageless IV therapy. Wonderful. We always want to look younger and we healthy want to and look our best. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Well, Dr. Wallach, thank you. This has been just absolutely wonderful to be able to sit and talk to you for a bit and, and to learn so much about menopause, things we can do to possibly alleviate some of the symptoms, have great sex uh, after menopause, and then some things we can do to increase our health span. So and your information is invaluable, and I'm certainly grateful for your time. Tell us where we can learn more about you and your practice and what you're doing and where we can contact you. So my practice is located in North Miami, Florida, and my website has a lot of information. It is Emanuela Wallach, md.com. I did post some of the videos explaining the procedures that we do in the office, including the vaginal laser procedure, including the IV therapies and the PRP. And the address is there. I also offer telemedicine. I have patients who are contacting me from Europe, from the Caribbean, from South America. I can help anyone through um, telemedicine at the moment. That's fantastic, especially at the time of COVID. That's extremely helpful. And I'll also make sure that I have your contact information and website in the show notes for all of our listeners to reference as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wallach. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye now. I hope you found this episode informative and helpful. Before I leave you, I did want to tell you about the chili pad today. I had mentioned it in a previous episode that I had bought it and hadn't tried it and was going to let you know how it went. And I'm here to report it's amazing. I've increased my deep sleep by about five to six points, averaging about 30, 35% of my sleep is in the deep sleep state which is so helpful for our brain health. And for those that aren't familiar with the chili pad, it's basically a pad that goes on top of your mattress and you can set it at any temperature from 55 degrees up to, I think it's 115. And for me, it's worked great because I find my body heat heats up the mattress and I wake up warm in the at night. So I highly recommend the Chili Pad to help with the quality of your sleep. I'll include a link in the show notes for your reference. And the show notes can be found on my webpage at ifnotnowwhen.best. I'm so grateful for you joining me today. And I continue to work hard to bring you valuable and relevant content. Wishing you peace, love, joy, and good health. Bye for now. Thank you.